Okay, I think we can start now. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Stephen Frenemann. I'm the product manager for antennas at Pointing Group. I'd firstly like to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. Uh, we will try to answer some of your questions directly and also take some questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, presenting today, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Andre Ferri. Dr. Ferri is the chairman of uh, Pointing Group. Andre is also a specialist and innovator on this topic. Over to you, Andre. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, well, firstly, welcome to everyone. We're actually quite surprised and excited to get such a number of people attending the webinar. I'm going to switch on the webcam, um, but I'm actually only going to do it for a short while, just so that you see that you've actually got the real guy speaking to you, um, and go through the agenda, and then I'm going to switch off again. Um, okay, let me just get my own image out of the agenda. Um, the real, the last sentence really what uh, caused us to give this, why pay for reputable wall designed antennas? We get this question a lot, and I think the whole thing starts with understanding the properties of antennas, the applications. In other words, antennas have got a lot more in them than what is apparent from a typical um, spec sheet. So it's really interpreting those spec sheets and watching out for some of the misleading and sometimes purely false type of claims people can put in the spreadsheet. I'm going to switch off the webcam now. And let's get into the meat of it. Okay, the most important part is really this drawing in front of you. This illustrates the frequency band used for cellular and of course a bit of Wi-Fi here. But what happened is right when we started cellular, it was mainly in the GSM 900 band. Then we got the 17, 1800 band, got the UMTS bands, 4G, and then people started using more and more bands. So you can see that we're using LTE 4G up to about 3.8 gigahertz. And recently, there's the digital dividend bands. And there's even a band at 450 megahertz that people are starting to use. Now, this band is really the reason why antenna design got very challenging. We don't mind. I think we've got excellent antenna designers on board. But to cover all of this band in a reasonable fashion, or whatever part of the band that you're promising to cover, is actually quite challenging. Antenna-wise, anyone that understands antennas will know that is not at all an easy matter. So let's start off just um, sort of taking everyone through the sort of main types of antennas that you get. Um, the, the most common one, I would say, is the um, Yagi or Yagi Uda antenna, typically used for television. But lo and behold, we actually do find people using them for cellular. Now, of course, they are very narrow band, so used to work okay when you only got the 900 megahertz band or only a narrow band, but really not desirable. People call this guy, the log periodic dipole array, a Yagi, but it isn't a Yagi. This guy's got very long elements on the one end, and much sh um, shorter ones in the front, and it's actually got a feed line linking them. This guy can actually cover any band that you design it for, and that's an excellent, although a bit big, but an excellent antenna, giving you high gain over the whole bandwidth, or whichever bandwidth you design it for. Omnis is the most interesting. What you see is effectively a high gain Omni. Now, high gain and Omni seem to be um, uh, contradictory in terms, but you can actually increase the gain of an Omni, and I'll explain what's important in these. Just to note that there's very few people, honestly, worldwide that can design these type of antennas to cover a wide frequency band. Extremely difficult to get an uh, omni antenna to, uh, to have both gain and cover a wide bandwidth. Panel antennas, very common. Um, th these typically have got a directional beam, and the beam gain is proportional to the area of the, or the size of the panel. It's very important. Uh, if people are interested, we can actually give you equations that tell you what's the maximum gain you can get out of a specific size. And we often see specifications claiming gains that's clearly impossible in terms of the size of the antenna. We've got small antennas. We call it a puck, refers to an ice hockey puck. Small enclosure, really designed for on vehicles, on devices, uh, machines, instruments, and so forth. And clearly, that antenna, you don't want or you cannot actually get high gain out of it. And you want it just to radiate satisfactory at all the frequencies. And remember this thing about all frequencies and in all directions. And I'll discuss both of those. MIMO, I'll explain in more detail. But these are, we're using two antennas for 2x2 two two MIMO. 
very soon we'll use 4x4 MIMA and so forth, but mainly it's 2x2 MIMA at the moment. So it's two antennas sometimes in one enclosure, and you can also use two separate antennas. But if you use 2x2 MIMA, you can effectively double your data rate if they are so-called decorrelated, and I'll explain it a bit better later. Helical antennas, these are directional, mainly used in mines and tunnels. Excellent propagation because they're circularly polarized. And uh, we've got reflector antennas, which one commonly see, but not often used for the whole cellular bands, quite often used in Wi-Fi communication. The picture here is one of the ones I truly love. Um, this is really starting to look at radiation patterns. And most of the antenna pa parameters relate to radiation pattern. Now, the first thing to note is that, that the radiation pattern is a three-dimensional thing. In other words, what this is representing, the distance from the middle represents the intensity of radiation. And this antenna would be radiating in this direction here. And in this case, it's also represented by color. So you can see the maximum band is in front. Um, but then what people typically do on spec sheets, they would cut it this way. And that would be called the elevation cut. And the elevation cut would be a side view. I prefer side view. I think people can relate to a side view of the antenna. And the other cut is this one that you see here. And that's really the radiation pattern in azimuth. But always do remember that those are just two slices out of a three-dimensional bubble, which describes how an antenna focuses the beam, and that's what gives it gain in specific directions. So if we now look at those 2D images, the, the one would be the top view, the one would be the side view. Um, the next sort of parameter that one often sees, and it's an important one, is the beam width. Now, antenna has not got like a beam that's got a certain width and then it disappears. What people refer to as a beam width is the point at which the tower drops. If that's the peak power, peak focused power. It drops here to half of its power, and half is also known as minus 3 dB. So it's the 3 dB beam width, also the half power beam width. Note that beam width is this complete arc. Um, in other words, it's not plus minus the beam width. The beam width is the complete arc that's covered. Also note that the gain is not maintained over that beam width. You're going to get the main gain, the P gain in the pattern, and up down to minus 3 dB. So if you're planning links um, that have to cover a number of sort of uh, different angles, uh, do keep that into account. Okay. Um, this again is, I think, one of the absolute crux type of slides to show. Uh, we're going to look at how does beam width influence gain. Once again, there's actually nice equations, which I don't want to bother with here, but if anyone is interested, there's fundamental limits in terms of how beam width and gain relates to each other. So when someone tells you the beam width of an antenna, you can actually sort of tell fundamentally what would be the maximum gain that could be obtained from that beam width. But in general, if we look at omni antennas, you could have a low gain, medium gain, or high gain omni. That would be quite a high gain omni. And if you look at the azimuth, once again, that's looking from the top. What you want from an omni, of course, is that it radiates equally well in all directions. Now, that's not at all obvious, especially if you're trying to do this over a wide frequency band. If you go to medium gain, you can see that the circle increases. So there's more gain going towards the sides, because we're looking from the top. And if we look at these side views, it really becomes clear why this happens. In other words, if you look at the low gain guy, the reason why we've got a little bit more gain in the isotrope, by the way, isotrope is something that radiates equally in absolutely all directions. But here you can see we started squashing an isotrope. It's like a balloon that you take and you squash it in the middle, and you can see we can make it increase towards the sides. So we can get gain. Um, while we still got an omnidirectional, never the same gain as what you can get out of a directional antenna, but we can squash it some more, and that will happen. And if we squash it some more, you can get high gain. What you just have to note is that getting this gain is not for free. In other words, you're getting less and less radiation at other angles, okay, in order to get a lot in this direction. So the higher the gain of omni antenna, the more careful you have to be in terms of erecting it. In other words, if this thing is slightly skewed, it could be pointing towards the ground and not give you the actual gain in the direction you're pointing. If you're on a hilly terrain and something like that, the same could happen. And of course, if you're on a yacht or something that tilts, you would rather like this or perhaps this, and that could give you better performance. Directional, pretty similar. 
except the difference here is that we are squishing the balloon in all directions. In other words, if you look at the top view, it's pointing or protruding or bulging in one direction, and the bottom view the same. If you go to say a 9 dBi antenna, that's about close to nine times um, the power that you would get out of isotrope, you can see that it gets narrower. And if you go to 14 dBi, you can see that this beam also gets narrower. So it also gets a little bit more difficult to align, or you have to do it more carefully at the high gain. And if you go to vicious, for example, it could get very sharp. Um, and the medium and low gain, low gain you'd often use if you actually want to give coverage, like in a Wi-Fi hotspot, if you put it in one corner of a warehouse, you can use this type of gain and you get almost 90 degrees coverage, which is actually a lot better than your typical Omni would give you. Just going over to the next slide. Very nice. So we've talked now of static radiation patterns. In other words, we've talked about radiation patterns, which varies in terms of the angle. But the real killer is what you just saw. In other words, as you change frequency, the radiation pattern, this whole 3D blob, also convolve and morphs into different shapes. And this is perhaps one of the most difficult things because gain is specified in the IEEE standards as the peak of the radiation at some angle. Now, of course, this is a nice technical spec, but we would actually like the thing to radiate where we want it to, not specifically just in one uh, at the direction of the maximum. But what the IEEE does not define is if you've got an antenna operating over a frequency band that starts at, say, 2.1 and goes to 2.5, the gain also varies over this frequency band. In other words, most people will quote you that gain. Okay, they, and I think legitimately can choose the peak, and, and we all love to do that. But unless they give you the full curve, we also quote the peak, by the way, but we do tend to give you almost with every product the gain over the frequency band. And from that, you can see that you often have very big variations from that peak gain. So once I get a bit of specmanship, and I'll show you an example of how this could confuse um, people to no end. If you look at the next um, drawing, it gives you an example of what we've often seen. Um, here you can see an antenna that's designed to cover this band. That would be, say, 1700 to 2.2. And that could be 900. And you can see that this antenna here could have a very low gain, could heat up to, say, ADBI there, and it could go lower again. Now, a manufacturer or reseller could legitimately claim this is an ADBI antenna. Um, and this band, you can see the same could be happening. And lo and behold, you could even find that out of band, you've got this point here. Now, once again, technically, correctly, you can quote this as the gain of the antenna, but clearly, absolutely useless to the user wants to know the gain in the bands that he would like to use it. This antenna here would have the same spec. In other words, it would have an ADVI spec. But I think for everyone, it's absolutely clear that this is tons better than this and tons more reliable. Because one of the additional problems, people will do field measurements. They'll measure and they say, oh, but your antenna does the same as some other antenna that's perhaps just a low-cost antenna designed in some mass produced um, factory and it could be that you're sitting there in which case you will get the same but your customer because the frequencies are different across countries networks and so forth could be sitting at another point so what you measure convince yourself it's actually equal to a pretty well designed antenna and um, could not at all be true they could obviously also go operate here where the antenna may overall be worse in terms of performance performance by the way is always most difficult to obtain at the lowest frequencies because the wavelength there changes rapidly. If we now look at the problems. Um, so the one problem you can see is the variations in frequency, but the other problems is the variations in direction. So here you've got, for example, a directional antenna, or two directional antennas, and you can see that the directional, they're pointing in this direction, that's where you would like to talk to, the base station, the other side of your link is in that direction. Now we've honestly seen this, where antenna would have this type of performance. In other words, it will have a null in this direction that you wish to talk to. Now it may seem like I'm exaggerating or talking nonsense, because why would anyone design this quite close to disaster of an antenna? But what often happens is it's not like they designed this. The antenna may have done this at some frequency, and then at some later frequency, it splits apart that morphing ball that you saw, and this happens and it gets back together again, 
But the one thing that's really amazing and once again legitimate is people will quit that game at this frequency where it actually became useless. And once again, technically speaking, they are correct. That is the maximum of the pattern. But to you as a user, that is absolutely, absolutely useless. So you really need to know that people design something to do what you would expect it to do. Um, or of course, test it to a lot of detail, but that's difficult. A, a nice Omni would do this. In other words, you want it to radiate maximum towards the horizon. It will be a lower gain guy, but still the same thing. And you would like it to be sort of omnidirectional, circular in all directions. And once again, you quite often find this type of behavior, especially on very small Omnis that should be doing this, where it's actually lobing. In other words, it's varying both in terms of its omnidirectionality and in terms of its elevation pattern. Now, one of those funny things that I told you about in tennis is that an isotrope has been distorted. This guy would be, are they would be able to quote higher gain for this antenna, this disastrous antenna, than what I ever can quote for this antenna. Because physics dictate that if I wanted to radiate in all directions, it will have lower gain than this guy, because this guy's got sort of hot spots in these directions. And I would actually quote you these hot spots, even though they are obscure directions that you would never want to talk to. So and once again, these things vary with frequency. So I have even see where a guy would choose this point, next frequency, the lobes will be in a different point, they'll choose that point. Clearly absolute nonsense, even though it is technically correct.